Welcome to APG Partshala. We are going to discuss the module Contemporary Continental Aesthetics in the paper Philosophy of Art and Aesthetics. This module is written by Anupam Yadav from Bits Pilani. I am Raghuram Raju from University of Hyderabad. Is Aesthetic experience has drawn the attention of philosophers on several important counts. First, is aesthetics related to truth? Is aesthetic experience amicable for rationality? Is aesthetic experience, a cognitive experience, or is it a non-cognitive subjective experience? So there are several accounts in the history where you have people taking this side or the other side. So there is a lot of discussion about aesthetics in Greek philosophy. There are instances where several accounts, several definitions were offered about beauty. Is beauty symmetry? Is beauty, you know, appealing? And things like that. Interestingly, you have an entire dialogue called symposium that is devoted to explaining beauty, love, and things like that by Plato. What we are going to discuss today is the contemporary continental discussion on aesthetics. The term aesthetics is coined by Alexander Baumgarten in 1750. And Emmanuel Kant, in his monumental work, The Critic of Judgment of 1719, has critically appropriated this term. So let us now look at two aspects of this problem. Let us look at the purview of the discussion that centers around inquiring into the art or artistic experience, the aesthetic experience. It centers around the sensory experience that something is, you know, given to our senses. It is also about the, our emotional experience. Do we get emotional experience when we watch a painting? or read a poem, or see a sculpture, or watch a play? Or is it about the appreciation of beauty or sublimity in both natural objects and artworks? Both aesthetic experience concerns not only the artworks, but also the natural objects. So this is the purview. These are the topics that gets covered in modern discussions on aesthetics. There's also a focus on aesthetic domains that range from is aesthetic experience true? Can we talk about truth in the context of aesthetic experience? Is the object of aesthetic experience a fact or is it merely an idea or a subjective experience or a feeling in the self of a person. So having looked at these two aspects of aesthetic experience, let us look at some contemporary continental philosophers views on aesthetics 
Let us take for discussion Martin Heidegger, Walter Benjamin, Gadamer, Levinas, and Michael Dufresne, some of the dominant philosophers from the continental philosophy and their views on aesthetic experience. Heidegger asked this question about the origin of the work of art. Is art related to or originated in the artist? Is the artist the originator of the work of art? Similarly, we can also ask, isn't the work that makes somebody an artist? So it is not that artist has created artwork. It is artwork that created through this an uh, artist. So he would argue that neither of them, neither the artist nor the artwork are the agencies to locate the origin of the work of art. So Heidegger in this context claims that we need a third thing to talk about the origin or location of art. And that is what he suggests that we should examine not the artist or the art, but artwork itself. That let us look at artwork itself, not merely the artist or the art. And look at the artwork to see how aesthetic experience centers around an artwork. Yeah, so the, he says that we must get into the actual artwork and then start analyzing what kind of aesthetic experience the actual artwork generates. And this, according to Heidegger, the third variable, subsumes both the art and the artist. Artwork subsumes both the art and the artist. In this context, Heidegger talks about what constitutes an art object, an actual art work. The first thing that he points out is that there is a thingliness in every piece of art. In other words, if you are talking about a sculpture, there is a granite. If you are talking about a painting, there is the thingness of the canvas. If you are talking about a poem, there is this written word. All these things are things. And for Heidegger, one cannot avoid this thingly character, though there is something more to artwork than this merely the objective or thinly work. To quote him, there is something stony in a work of architecture, wooden in a carving, colored in a painting, spoken in a linguistic work, sonorous in a musical composition, unquote. So this is something that is inevitable in an art work. And this cannot be removed. So the thingness or thingness or thingly is irremovable from any artwork. But then that is not to say that everything is confined to that thingliness. It is not to reduce artwork to objects. No. But then it is necessary to accept that there is something that you have to accept, which is the thing that present in an artwork. Heidegger here contemplates on the three traditional interpretations that were there before him, before he advances this thingness of artwork. The first one is 
the one, the view which says that there are certain properties in artwork, like granite that I mentioned to you, is a property. There are, the second one is that artwork generates sensory perceptions in us. It generates the perception of color, sound, roughness, and so on, which is a subjectivist position. The third one is that artwork is about a form, an idea, that there is a granite, but that granite is not an artwork. Now you have to impose a form and bring a sculpture out of that granite. So this requires that there is this dead granite, which is a content, which is the thing, and that is not a hard work, that is not in itself a, a, a candidate for artwork. An artist has an idea, has a form, and he tries to bring that form by chiseling it in a particular way and make it into a, a sculpture. So this is what is there in art. Heidegger rejects all these three. He says that it is not merely material properties, it is not merely subjective sensations, it is not merely form. Because if you say that form is crucial to art, there is nothing that does not have a form. Even granite, before it is made into a sculpture, also has a form. You may not consider that to be a, an artistic form, but somebody else might. Somebody else might find that to be a, a having an artistic form. So nature has a lot of you know, facts, uh, 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 there are artifacts, and nature also creates facts, objects that are may be beautiful. So Heidegger says that it is neither objective nor subjective nor idealistic kind of thing or form. Okay? It is something which is which what he calls as an artwork discloses. For Heidegger, the artwork is not just a product of an artist bringing a form into the into existence. It is just not that. He says that when an artist makes an art piece, there is a purpose to that. There is a purpose or the usefulness of the thing. So there is a reason why an artist makes a sculpture out of the granite. And this is what he calls as equipmentality. The equipmentality is what makes an artist to bring an art work with a particular kind of purpose. That is the important aspect that underlies an artistic experience. Equipmentality for Heidegger serves as the basis of the being of all things. Take for example the painting of Van Gogh, which is the peasant show. The peasant show shows the ease and reliability with which the peasant wears the show. It also reveals the toil in the field in the early dark hours of the day. It also discloses the equipmentality of the shoes. The important aspect to this is also that the shoe is related to the earth and there is a contact between the shoe and the mud and so on so forth. The truth brought about by the work is unconcealment. It discloses to you. It is unhiding. It's a disclosure, which to use a Greek word, aletheia. Truth in the artwork, Heidegger says, is not merely correspondence to reality. It is not 
a correspondence to reality in the sense that the Van Gogh peasant shoe is not just describing the peasant shoe. It is doing something more. It is a disclosure of the historical reality or the world people live in. He says that it sets up a world. It sets up, the painting sets up not a description of that reality, but discloses to you several other things and brings them directly in front of you. So direct, uh, this directness is something which is stunningly unique about art experience. Heidegger gives another example of the Greek temple of Pastum. The temple work manifests the historical period, the entire ethos of that context, the shared cultural and religious beliefs that are associated with it. He says, and I quote, it is a temple work that first fits together and at the same time gathers around itself the unity of those paths and revelations in which birth and death, disaster and blessing, victory and disgrace, endurance and decline acquire the shape of destiny for human being. So there are this cluster of the complex crisscrossings of several things that get reflected in a temple. So temple is not just a place of worship. It is, of course, a place of worship, but then it also gets several things imbricated along its matrix. For Heidegger, the temple also illuminates what the Greeks called physis or nature. Against the temple, we notice the violence of the storm, the grace of the sun, the trees, the birds being perched upon and so on. The temple work, Heidegger says, and I quote, standing there opens up a world and at the same time sets this world back again on earth, which itself only thus emerges as native ground, unquote. So there is this complex web of things that surround the artistic experience. So for Heidegger, artistic experience or the art does, is not located either in the artist or in art, but in artwork. And the artwork is not just something which is given to us in a bare way. It has association of several aspects that I just discussed with you. So this is the one of the important interpretation of hard work that comes from the continental philosophy. The second thinker that we're going to discuss is Walter Benjamin. Walter Benjamin brings a very important issue for discussion within the artistic aesthetic experience, which is the politicization of art. He says that in the contemporary time, there is a major shift where arts gets associated with the capitalistic conditions of mass production or reproduction and this brings in different kinds of politics. The reproduction of the modern capitalistic system is slightly different from the kind of reproductive uh, abilities people had earlier. Greeks, he says, he admits, did have the ability to reproduce because they knew the art of founding and stamping. In the Middle Ages, it was engraving and etching, and in the 19th century, lithography made its appearance, which later made way for photography. But the modern technological reproduction of art, especially with the advent of photography and film production, has seriously damaged the essence of art and has politicized it. And he takes the example of photography, film, and sense perception. And he says with photography, pictorial reproduction gained acceleration since the eye perceives more swiftly than the hand can draw. As a result, the technical reproduction makes a tremendous impact on the function of art and art perception. For instance, you take 
the, the instances in India where there are Mauryan ragas and Evering ragas, but then they get imbricated in the technological reproduction. And then you have situation where morning ragas are played even in the evenings. So now you cannot say that you know that that you will you will not play them. That that is not because. I, but then if you play it, it is no more compatible with the kind of a background that you have. So now you play morning ragas even in evening because it is made possible by technology. So this, according to Benjamin, destroys the originality or the authenticity of the artwork and dissociates it from the original fabric of tradition in which the work enjoys its ritualistic value, especially of the magical and religious kinds. Benjamin describes it beautifully. Let me quote. If, while resting on a summer afternoon, you follow with your eyes a mountain range on the horizon or the branch which casts its shadow over you, you experience the aura of those mountains of that branch. But suppose, if you look at the, 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 the photography of these mountains, they will give you different kinds of perception. Now, what is important, according to Benjamin, is photography will make things very closer to you. Photography can take you to the details which a painting cannot take. But what is the difference between these two modes is there is a human touch, more human touch in a painting than in a photography. In a photography, though there is a photographer, but the instrument called photography dominates more than in comparison to the, 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 the brush or even the paint in the case of the painting. That's the point that he makes. And this, according to Benjamin, changes our perception drastically. Let's take Gadamer's on aesthetic experience and hermeneutics. Right in the beginning, we discussed Kant, and Kant introduced a distinction in his critic of judgment between judgment of beauty and judgment of virtue. The judgment of beauty is without any selfish interest. Uh, it is a, disinter a disinterested pleasure. And the judgment of virtue, in contrast, is a desire to bring the action into existence. The judgment of beauty and sublimity are independent from sensuous cognition and rational judgment. So there is an a priori element of pleasure which is beyond any empirical validity in Kant. The universality of this a priori principle assigns validity to an aesthetic judgment. Gadamer appreciates Kant for recognizing aesthetic experience such as beauty as valid over and above rational faculties. But he criticizes Kant for denying any event of knowledge and his attempt to reduce aesthetic taste to one subjectivity. Against this, he argues that there is a cognitive element or truth in aesthetic pleasure beyond subjectivity. There is what he calls as the ideality of good taste to which every object of taste is drawn to and derives cognitive character. And it is this universal element which makes the aesthetic test communicable and prevents it from reducing it to one subjective whims. The aesthetic experience for Gadamer is experience which has, which is already impregnated with meaning and it also has a hermeneutical dimension in the sense that it is in interpretative and following Husserl he also says that there is an intentionality associated with it. An aesthetic experience, Gadamer argues, to quote him, suddenly takes the person experiencing it out of the context of his life by the power of the work of art and it relates him back to the whole of his experience, unquote. So, and it is not just one experience amidst the myriad of experiences in one's life. Rather, aesthetic experience represents the whole. The whole it opens up. And to put it in his own words, in the experience of art, there is present a fullness of meaning which belongs not only to this particular content or object, but rather stands for the meaningful whole of life. 
He calls this the transformative power or the truth we confront with an aesthetic experience. This thus makes aesthetic experience not merely subjective, makes it embedded with meaning, amicable for different interpretations, and in bringing intentionality, it makes aesthetic experience not a passive activity, but more importantly, it also makes it communicable. So there is an intersubjectivity that it is cognitive and I, it has a meaning and I can access it, I can interpret it, I have an intentionality associated with it and I also can communicate it. All these things are very important in Gadamer. An artwork is not a mere representation. He rejects it representation theory of artistic work. Rather for him it is a presentation, a work or a creation the experience of which does not get exhausted in a conceptual determination. It's a presentation, it's not just merely representation. So there is no absolute tr truth that we arrive at in an artistic you know, work. An art experience is a temporal or historical experience which transforms the one who is experiencing it. So when I look at an art object, I not only look at it, and have a perception about it, experience about it, I also get transformed by looking at it. The transformativeness is integral to every art experience. In the experience of art, says Gadamer, we see a genuine experience induced by the work which does not leave him who has it unchanged." Unquote. It addresses us, it questions us, and it changes the person who experiences it. The subject of the experience of art, that which remains and endures, is not a subjectivity of a person who experiences it, but the work itself. This he calls as ontological truth of art. Like Heidegger and Greek philosophers, Gadamer considers truth as unconcealment or disclosure or the transformative moment which one can counters in the event of an aesthetic experience. But such a moment is possible only when an artwork asserts its own being. So he takes the example of an art as a play. In his book, The Relevance of the Beautiful, Gadamer emphasizes the social function and anthropological groundness of the artwork by using the concepts like play, symbol, and festival. In contemporary art, the stress is upon the content as opposed to the traditional stress on form. Drawing upon the Greek philosophy, Gadamer claims that art has a universal philosophical significance in the sense in which Aristotle has said that poetry is more philosophical than history. Its ontological function lies in bringing, bridging the gap between the real and the ideal. So giving the analogy of play to explain ontological function of art, Gadamer says, play has no purposive rationality, but it has its own seriousness and requires playing along with. In play, players lose their subjective consciousness. The work of art has its own being, is beyond the subjectivity of the creator and the changes the person who experiences it. Similarly, he talks about the symbol. Symbol is a power of recognition of something that we already know. So it is a sort of reminder, but in the recognition, there is also a joy and even a pain. The fourth thinker that we are going to discuss today is Emmanuel Levinas. Levinas describes art as shadow. He attacks the view that art is about the real. He says, no, it is not about the real. In contrast, Levinas argues that art is about resemblance. It is a shadow. He writes, I quote, Art does not know a particular type of reality. It contrasts with knowledge. It is the very event of obscuring, a descent of the night, an invasion of shadow. Art does not belong to the order of revelation, nor does it belong to that of creation, which moves in just the opposite direction." Unquote. The images do not cognize truth in the sense of resembling the original. Image, according to Levinas, itself has an independent reality. He argues that reality would not be only what it is, what it is disclosed to be in truth, but would be also its double, its shadow, its image. 
or does not reveal but bring about this essential doubling of reality. There is a passivity, there is also disinterestedness in the appreciation of art or image. This is something which is very special about Levinas. Unlike other people who look at artist, artistic experience as active, Levinas says that it also is passive. An image, says Levinas, marks a hold over us rather than our initiative. A fundamental passivity, possessed, inspired an artist we may hearken or to amuse. Unquote. The imaginary, the musical. An artwork makes its claim on us, which is magical. Levinas explains this as the rhythm, which is not so much the poetic order, but the way it affects us. Rhythm represents a unique situation where one cannot speak of consent, assumption, initiative, or freedom, because the subject is caught up and carried away by it. In rhythm, there is no longer a one self, but rather a sort of passage from one self to anonymity. Rhythm does not have its privileged locus in music. It is the very feature of sound, and sound is the quality most detached from the object. Levinas insists on the musicality of every image to emphasize that an aesthetic element, as its etymology suggests, is a sensation that cannot be captured in conceptual perception, but attained in the music or rhythm. The last thinker that we're going to discuss is Michael Dufresne, his idea of aesthetic object. He revives the original Greek meaning of ethesis as sense experience or feeling, and he says that this feeling has no rational content. It is also not an understanding of some elevated imaginative experience of a creative genius. His existential approach indeed relates aesthetic experience to reality, the modes of making sense of human reality. Art experience for him is, the, is experienced, it is a felt world, it is not representing the world. It is an aesthetic object and it is through the aesthetic quality of feeling that the spectator is able to relate to it. The idea of work of art for him can be seen purely as an intentional object, a mark of its creator and the appreciation of it as an imaginative transposition into the original mental realm of its creator. Dufresne avoids this psychologism and adopts a spectator's perspective. A work of art has its autonomy and is the ground of the emergence of an aesthetic object which an aesthetic appreciation is desired to culminate into. He defines the aesthetic object as that perception which the work of art induces the spectator to realize. A spectator is an active participant in this process but does not create the aesthetic object instead perceives it faithfully. Let's summarize what we have discussed so far. Kant distinguished between aesthetic experience and objective reality. He did not concede the cognitive element to aesthetic experience. And then there are people who argued that it is not a artistic experience, is not same as grasping the objective reality. In an artistic experience, we encounter different worlds of historical reality. Of, we also face the cultivating of one's own understanding. Both Heidegger and Gadamer stressed upon the idea of truth as disclosure in the artistic experience. In Benjamin, we have seen how art in the contemporary capitalistic production and reproduction using new technology gets politicized. Both Levinas and Dufresne looked at how art being a means of cognition. Okay. So we have looked at the various dimensions of artistic experience in the contemporary continental philosophies. Thank you.